Thank you very much for inviting me, having me here, and thank you for coming to listen. I'm sorry we're late. Um, there was nothing to be done about that. What I'm presenting today is um, not a finished paper. It's a beginning of, um, of something, and the only reason I dare to show you something that is at such a state of being unfinished is because I'm hoping to get your help. So I'm hoping that you will give me a feedback which will help me to further develop what I'm working on. Do any of you share my experience that when you are or were pregnant or personally close to a pregnant person, it suddenly seemed as if you encounter other pregnant persons everywhere. Somehow in the course of the pregnancy, the shape of the protruding, pro, protruding belly seems to have multiplied. At first glance, glance, this might seem a matter of comparability, a recognition of self-sameness based on the relative similarity of form, the rounded belly. Can those of you with green eyes get up and stand in the right-hand corner of the room? And all those of those who have stretch marks on their belly due to pregnancy go to the left corner and those who have had an abortion remain seated, please. And those who have no health insurance start singing. And those who find themselves in this place accidentally, what are you doing here? In one of her earlier books, The Threshold of the Visible World, Kaja Silverman elaborates on assimilatory or incorporative identification as theorized by Freud. And she says, I firmly believe incorporative logic to be at the heart of a normative adult subjectivity. Indeed, it provides the very basis of the formation of a coherent bodily ego. By identifying others as self-same, the self creates and fortifies itself. But when this delusory process fails, and it can fail for a multitude of reasons, the self reacts murderously. So we cannot, she gives this example of uh, being approached by a homeless man who's really, really smelly, and where she cannot deal with this proximity and the smell and reacts violently to it. She, Silverman already points out then when she writes this in the 90s, the wider social impact of this normative subject constriction based on similarity and self-sameness, on comparability. Based on and reflecting back onto the visual field, and in her wake, artists like Harun Faroki and Hito Steil have thematized the visual dispositif of racial profiling and various other techniques of surveillance and control. In fact, the state's interpolation of pregnant persons into its biopolitics is something that also has a visual formation, not only, but it also has a visual formation. Yet the sudden seeing of pregnant bellies everywhere, which is done by the person pregnant or by the person close to a pregnant person, could also be understood as a partial connection in Marilyn Stratton's sense. It would then be interpretable as a form of association prompted by a visual clue with others, or to go one step further, a forging of a relationship with the world. In this description, the visual clue, the protruding belly, the rounded shape, does not fully define the self or the other, but creates a link in the form of a similarity of shape that allows the pregnant person to experience a sense of community and through this of being in the world. 
And this is important to pregnant women because part of this experience of pregnancy is being pathologized as if it's an illness. So um, that there's actually something redeeming about seeing others who are like that, then you realize it's not a pathology. Right now, I am pregnant with an idea. Though I must admit, this pregnancy is in its very first weeks of the first trimester, so I can still abort it. But I'm seeing partial connections in everything I encounter. The idea is that I must make an art institution in the place where I live. One that is materially connected to everyday life, rather than seeking employment elsewhere. So when the conveners of the symposium ask, what kind of relationships can be established between similar and dissimilar elements, and call for attempts to explore Stratton's proposition that the relation of items from different scales might be productive, and when moreover, Stratton's narrative is ripe with suggestive modeling, my imagination goes into overdrive. Infinite proliferation of partial connections reign. Hence my abstract. If I find it, I can reread it to you, which I would like to do. On an attempt to attach some strings. In her book, um, Partial Connections, Marilyn Stratton spends quite some time discussing string bags and their uses by the different communities she has been researching and thinking about. Though her musings pivot around sexual difference, and this is entirely unrelated to the topic I want to discuss, my lecture will attempt to use some of her imagery to consider a model of institution building. This is what I remembered from my reading about the string back in Partial Connections, in this book, in this text by Marilyn Stratton. That it is made by women and worn by women and men. That women and men carry different things in it and that they carry it in, in different ways and therefore it has different signification. Women carry children and produce in it and thus like the wombs it signifies life and men carry symbols of their status that only the men adorn their bags and thus the fabric becomes opaque and their objects hidden. So this is actually one of these bags adorned with feathers. That these bags pulsate. They swell and deflate depending on what is put into them or taken out and that they're somehow part of the body. So it is as if the body swells and deflates. No, to be more precise, it is a body which swells and deflates. Since for all purposes of signification, the bag is part of the body. I remembered something suggesting an, intri um, an intrigue with the shape and its meaning. I remembered, and this seemed particularly significant to me when I was thinking about this lecture, that some person tried to market these bags and failed. Because they are made only for a person known to the maker by face and mostly in the context of kinship. Finally, I remembered that much of what Stratton was concerned with had to do with gender. But this did not seem so interesting to my own partial connection, thus I felt I could leave it aside. Then I reread the text. And I had to admit to myself that though I had remembered, what I had remembered was not entirely wrong. Another partiality established itself. First of all, much of what Stratton writes is based on another one's research, Maureen McKenzie, from a text from 1986. In 1991, the same year as Partial Connections, McKenzie publishes a second text, androgynous objects, string bags, and gender in central New Guinea. And this one, I read a review of 
which argues that Mackenzie's interpretation as to the androgyny of the string bags, which actually then um, um, Strat Stratern builds on, might not be, and I cite, shared by the Telefall people themselves, since she tends to adduce direct statements by informants only to qualify or refute them from her wider school perspectives. So this statement must be taken with a grain of salt. For the review is not written by Telefall either. I mean, this, this review is, is also not written by the, the, by the Telefall. Um, but by an expert who obviously has a problem with the introduction of feminist perspectives into his field. The trope of defending the other from misinterpretation while furthering one, one's own goal is an old one in, in, in ethnology and other, other human, also human science. Moreover, does not Stratton in her own introduction say, and I cite, some would say that access has always lain at the heart of interpretive practice. And yet, and yet, only when reading the review of Mackenzie and realizing that Mackenzie's interpretive text is used by Stratern as if it were a primary source to be interpreted by herself. And indeed, she goes a feminist and very productive step further in her interpretation of gender relations of the telephone. Did I become aware of the naturalizing tendency of Stratern's text? I found it quite shocking that I had allowed Stratern's self-reflexivity and critique of the methods of anthropological knowledge production to lull me into an uncritical response to her narrative of Melanesia. So I'm not saying that Stratern shouldn't be doing what she's doing. I think she has the right to do that, and she argues as well why she has the right. But I think that I should not be reading this text uncritically but because she's talking so much about this kind of feminist ethics in her text, I'm not, I had really had not seen anymore how she's using her primary sources. I'd become unaware of the, um, of the fact that it is a narrative. Or possibly I, don't, I simply do not get anthropology. In any case, I thought it right to react by turning around the mirror in order to find out where the descriptive prose on the subject of the swelling of the belly or the body seems equally valid or slightly weird when used upon an, a Western example. Nevertheless, the idea to use the string bag as a mediator of my project stuck. Allow me to explain. So there are these two schools around the corner of where I live. Um, um, a primary school and then a higher school. And they're doing projects that I find quite interesting. One of them, they were researching what kind of people live um, in the area. Migrants, drug dealers, old people, little store owners. They were interviewing them. Then they were building their own worlds on on this research that they did, and they lived in these worlds and actually played migration for th three weeks. And then some of them made a theater piece about this. They wrote this theater piece themselves, and here you see them presenting this theater piece. And another project, we'll leave this for a second for it. Um, at the higher school, this is a school which has basically within an area in Berlin which is being highly gentrified at the moment, um, has almost solely migrant school kids and it's very well known for its criminality and uh, white majority Germans don't send their kids there. It's called Wessif Reseli Schule School. Resif Reseli. And, um, and there, some people worked with kids, and the kids actually um, did a film, which you will see an excerpt from here, about respect. 
So this chapter that you see, and it's in German, but I can explain a little bit beforehand, is about um, punctuality, which I think may, might make sense in the context of this to this morning. So um, what you see is the teacher uh, without any kids, and then you see the kids, and they're talking to each other. They're doing things. And when um, those of you who understand German will see that they're all talking with with a dialect or with, with an accent. So they're all, they're, these are kids, like the kids of the school. So I'll, sh I'll show this. Wie geht's? Ich bin der kleine Gangster. Oh, der Son Ericsson, ich habe einen Anruf gefangen. Ich frage mich jedes Mal, warum gehe ich nur ran? Jo, nix mal, geh nicht mal, drück nicht mal an. Ich frage mich jedes Mal, wer ist denn da dran? Wo ja, wer wird denn Jugi Jo? Heute ist es voll. So, wir waren stehen geblieben beim Dreieckshandel. Welche Länder waren dann beteiligt am Dreieckshandel? Afrika. Wer noch? Okay, und noch? Genau, genau. Europa. Genau. Und unter diesen drei Ländern oder Kontinenten gab es den Dreieckshandel. Was haben die denn für Waren hin und her verschifft? Da wird schnell, wach auf, wir haben die Geschichtsstunde verpasst, schnell. Wach We auf. missed our history lesson. Wach auf, hätte ich. Gehen diese zwei sind wieder da, die kommen, lass ich nicht Komm, die sind zu spät. Hey, ich hab die nur... Entschuldigung, dass ich zu spät bin. Meine Opa hat den platten Reifen. So now they're giving the most okay, absurd okay. explanations for being late. Entschuldigung, dass wir zu spät sind. Äh, als wir draußen waren, habe ich meine Mutter gesehen mit Drogen auf der Straße. Und zwar rot, weil wir sind uns hinterher gerannt, wo wir zur Schule kommen wollten. Da mussten wir einen ganzen Block rennen. Entschuldigung, dass ich zu spät, spät komme. Der Weg war verspätet und wir müssen einen anderen langen Weg nehmen. Entschuldigung, äh, dass ich zu spät bin, weil ich äh, abends nicht schlafen könnte. Entschuldigung, dass ich zu spät bin, wir mussten unsere Hausaufgaben fertig machen. Entschuldigung, dass ich zu spät bin, meine kleinen Schüsseln haben mich geärgert. Entschuldigung, dass ich zu spät bin, weil einer wollte Schläge auf der Straße. Entschuldigung, dass ich zu spät bin, mein Reifen war platt. Entschuldigung, dass ich zu spät gekommen bin. Ich muss einen Film drehen. Ja. Bei Ihnen sind ja alle da. Bei mir sind immer alle Schüler pünktlich. So, Oder? all kids are there, where well, they're always punctual. So they say, it's a, it's a German saying, saying five minutes before the time is really punctual. This is not an artwork. This is a film made with the help of mediators by the kids.
At this point in time of my personal life, I find this kind of cultural production so much more attractive than a majority of cultural production happening in the art world. And I, this is one of the reasons why I would like to enter this field, enter these schools, and make an institution in a school, an institution of art. But I don't want to do it the way that it is being done, because it is being done a lot in Germany. There is a term called um, cultural education. Do you have a similar term here in, in Spain? Cultural education was somehow figured out about as a term, as a major term, um, defining cultural policies in Germany um, about 15 years ago. It's part of the, um, the spanning of the welfare state and also the spanning, uh, spanning of the cultural sector. It's at the time when institutions like museums are asked to find new publics. Yeah? But also at a time when the state's not supporting integration um, um, or suppo supporting actually a, a, a social harmony in a certain way um, by cutting um, a lot of what, what we used to be very where, um, um, th th be thinking of as natural, like primary care, primary school kids care and so on. So um, they th thought of this term as a way that was replacing in the discourse the welfare state as something that will help with integration. So the idea is that if you're through cultural um, education, you can lead disenfranchised factors of the public um, into the German nation state in a harmonious way. You know, they can go to the museum and they have some conflicts there with artists and artworks. And then they will come out as, you know, integrated. It's as simple as that, sadly. It's as simple as that. Um, at the same time, the museums were also asked, you know, they were asked to prove that what they're doing has some impact in the wider public. So the museums at the same time are trying to figure out how to get migrants into the museum without much of an idea why they should be in the museum. And then all these new kind of jobs are established of cultural educators who are, you know, public programs, cultural education, and this is also part of it, I think, what we're doing here. That are, but I, you know, I see a particular kind of people here, I think, um, and another not, I think. Um, and it's a, it's a huge, business in Germany, at the same time it's completely under-resourced. So all the people who are working, like this woman who worked with the kids here, she's making very little money doing this. She's going into the school, she's working with the kids, but she's not, she cannot really support herself on this kind of practice. So the, the, actually the educators are, are disproportionately paid little. And at the same time, um, the discourse production around this is huge. So you have the cultural institutions of the state, like the Bundeskulturstiftung, and then private foundations, like Mercator Stiftung in Germany, or Altana Stiftung, getting together to try to define cultural education. And there's, they publish, and they have seminars and so on. And a lot of the, when you read what they're publishing, a lot of this discourse is completely economized. So there's, for instance, money for cultural educators to go into school. So this film, for instance, was supported with this money. But in order for get, to get this money, and it's not much money, something like 2,000 euros, you have to write these applications yeah, that take ages, not only do you have to write these applications, and teachers normally don't have time to do that, right? So this is happening not in a sustainable way. But at the same time, these 
bodies that have been built of, I would say, what is you know a kind of state governance, even though it's also private founda foundations, and it's also um, researchers at universities who are contributing to this. Um, they're suddenly calling for what they call quality control. So they're saying there's a problem because the art that is shown at, and that is, it is brought to the schools is not highly qualitative art. So there's, and they're, they're judging what these people are doing and these people need to legitimate what they're doing in the schools and the bodies that are legitimate, that are controlling this are the bodies of, are people, are filled with people that are actually, um, that are actually um, in very privileged positions and are defining majority culture. And the interesting thing is not even a state museum is asked in the same way to, to give legitimation to the kind of art that they're showing. They're asked to give legitimation to their pub numbers of public, but they're not asked to give, to prove that what they're showing is good art, yeah? So it's a, it's, there is a discrepancy between the projection and what the state wants with it and the, the precarity, precarity of this work that is done. And this is just one problem of it. So when I say I want to make an institution in a school, you know, um, I have to negotiate this and I, the kind of art I want to bring to the school is actually art that is not on the surface about politics or not, this is a work by Alejandra Rera. it is actually, but on, on, its, on the surface it's not. And this one is a work by Pissarro, it's, um, it looks like an impressionist painting, and it is an impressionist painting, but it's also, if you know about Pissarro, he was um, um, quite revolutionary, and what this is actually is, this is a woman on strike. She's, she's put down, um, at, at the time when he was painting in France, there were farm workers were, um, were doing strikes. So what you see is someone who's not working. Yeah. So, um, but this is not the kind of art that that is normally thought to be in a school as in to be something that these kids that you saw can deal with. So I'm interested in making this uh, making this somehow bridging this gap between this kind of art and this social reality of working in a school. One of the problems with this uh, that you have to think about when you're when you're you're trying to assimilate or somehow connect, actually make a partial connection of some something that is such an alien body as a kind of art practice in a school, and the school everyday school life is a question is a matter of timing. Things really work in different kinds of timings and rhythms, and whether that becomes extremely difficult to work with this because you somehow have to adapt to this, to the school, to the way that they're timing, they're bound by different kind of relations and connections. Um, so I was thinking if I don't want to enter into this discourse about cultural education, that means I will probably not be able to apply for state money or even the money from these private foundations. So there's a question of my, how to do an institution without money. But it's also a question of how to bring together similar worlds, these similar words of art and school. And then there's this question of how to, a question of energy, how to, to do something that is not simply event-based, but somehow also not calcified. Because most of the self-organized institutions that I've known that I've experienced myself since I was a student. They start out as initiatives, and then at some point, the precarity of it is not um, supportable anymore. And then there's this question, are you going to disband the group, or are you going to try to institutionalize it? And then this kind of fixing 
of the institutionalizing comes with certain costs, and there are certain winners to it and others who are not winning. So I don't want to do that. And the image of the string bag actually started to help me think about this. Because on the other hand, you could just say you're making something event-based. So I'm, for instance, in the, I brought um, the artist Ina Stujak to the school. This artist is working with the kids. She's portraying the kids. Um, and I'm also planning on making a, um, um, a film festival at the school with films about school and so on. These are kind of events. But then w you make a lot of events and, and you don't have a, what, what's, what's left. Even, you know, what, what uh, you, 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 you put a lot of energy in, but there's no institutional learning. Yeah. So Actually, what was somehow enticing to me was this idea that um, if you think of this institution like the ba string bag, that it's somehow part of the body, but it's also not. It's also attached to it. And it kind of opens up when it's needed, and it closes back down when it's not needed, or when there's nothing to say or nothing to do. So I was thinking that maybe an institution should be constructed like this bag. Uh, Marilyn Stra um, Stratern um, talks about this pulsation. I was thinking this can be filled by the artists or it can be filled by the kids or it can fill by co some community activity. Um, and she, she writes about this pulsation. Communities expand and scatter again, gathered in from their dispersed gardens. People become momentarily conscious both of their own centrality and of the necessity to maintain relations with other centers on their periphery. A contraction and expansion of focus. The pulsation between center and periphery that links but does not encompass or exhaust the difference between communities appears to work for a relatively circumscribed local region. So this is a model that needs to be made, built for a particular locality and school. It's not, you know, there is a question of translating this, this idea of the, of, the, of the string bag onto this particular school. And this is something where I haven't, which I need to do, which I cannot present to you yet. Yeah. So this is something that needs to be done. It's not okay to create this as a model and then commodify it and transfer it to other places. But so far it's only an image. And I would be really interested in discussing with you um, whether th this is even a viable idea or whether I should abort it. Let's start anew. I would like to shift my attention to another back via yet another Stratton quote. There's a resistance in telephomine to, uh, to developing the string bag as a commodity. Telephone women display a singular lack of interest in providing bilums, that's a, the generic term for these string bags, for an external market. Allow me to read you an abridged version of B. Traven's story titled Assembly Line. And this abridged um, bridging was done by John Barker and Ines Tuyak because they were planning to use this story for an exhibition, but I think so far they haven't. So this is from the 30s, this text. The Indian was busy making little baskets from bast and from all kinds of fibers gathered by him in the immense tropical bush which surrounded the village on all sides. The material used had not only been well prepared for its purpose, but was also richly colored with dyes that the basket maker himself extracted from various native plants, barks, roots, and from certain insects by a process known only to him and the members of his family. His principal business, however, was not producing baskets. He was a peasant who lived on what the small property um, he possessed, of, of, of what the small property he possessed produced. Baskets he made when there was nothing else for him to do in the fields, because he was unable to dawdle. After all, the sale of his baskets, though to a rather limited degree only, added to the small income he received from his little farm. 
In spite of being, by profession, just a plain peasant, it was clearly seen from the small baskets he made that at heart he was an artist, a true and an accomplished artist. Each basket looked as if covered all over with the most beautiful and sometimes fantastic ornaments, flowers, but butterflies, birds, squirrels, antelopes, tigers, and a score of other animals of the wilds. Yet the most amazing thing was that these decorations all of them symphonies of color, were not painted on the baskets, but were instead actually part of the baskets themselves. Bast and fibers dyed in dozens of different colors were so cleverly, one must actually say intrinsically, interwoven that those attra attractive designs appeared on the inner part of the basket as well as on the outer. This performance he accomplished without ever looking at any sketch or pattern. Mr. A. E. L. Winthrop of New York was on vacation in the Republic of Mexico. How much for that little basket, friend, he asked. 50 centavos, patroncito, my good little lordy, the Indian answered politely. All right, sold. He had expected to hear a price of three or even four pesos saw right away what great business possibilities this miserable Indian village might offer to a dynamic promoter like himself. After returning from the USA with a profitable contract for such baskets to be mass produced, and here some things are cut in the story. I've got big business for you, my friend, Mr. Winthrop began. Suppose I ordered you to make 10,000 of these baskets. How much time do you think you would need to deliver them? Here you see how that looks, the 10,000 baskets. How much time would, do you think you would need to deliver them? After a few minutes, the Indian, without interrupting his work, said in a slow voice, it will take a good long time to make so many baskets, patroncito. You see, the bast and the fibers must be very dry before they can be used properly. Then all during the time they're slowly dying, they must be worked and handled in a very special way so that while drying they won't lose their softness and their flexibility and their natural brilliance. Even when dry, they must look fresh. They must never lose their natural properties or they will look just as lifeless and dull as straw. Then while they're drying, I got to get the plants and roots and barks and insects from which I brew the dyes. That may, takes much time also, believe me. The plants must be gathered when the moon is just right or they won't give the right color. The insects I pick from the plants must also be gathered at the right time and under the right conditions or else they produce no rich colors and are just like dust. But of course, Jefecito, I can make as many as these canastitas as you wish, even as many as three dozen if you want them. Only give me time. Three dozens. Three dozens? Mr. Winthrop yelled and threw up both arms in desperation. Three dozens, he repeated, as if he had to say it, say it many times in his own voice so as to understand the real meaning of it. He had expected the Indian to go crazy on hearing that he was to sell 10,000 of his baskets without having to peddle them from door to door and be treated like a dog with a skin disease. So the American took up the question of price again, by which he hoped to activate the Indian's ambition. See, si, patroncito, I have the price ready. It is well calculated now without any mistake on my side. If I got to make 1,000 canastitas, each will be three pesos. If I must make 5,000, each will cost nine pesos. And if I have to make 10,000, in such a case, I can't make them for less than 15 pesos each. Immediately, he returned to his work as if he were afraid of losing too much time with such idle, idle talk. Mr. Winthrop thought it was perhaps his faulty knowledge of his foreign language that had played a trick on him. Did I hear you say 15 pesos each if I eventually would buy 10,000? That's exactly, and without any mistake, what I've said, Patroncito, the Indian answered in his soft and courteous voice. Mr. Winthrop felt as if he would go insane any minute now. 
Yes, so you said. Only what I can't comprehend is why you cannot sell at the same price if you make me 10,000. I certainly don't want to chisel on the price. I'm not that kind. Obvi only, well, let's see. Now, if you can sell for 40 centavos at all, be it for 20 or 50 or 100, I can't quite get the idea why the price has to jump that high if I buy more than 100. Bueno, patroncito. What is there so difficult to understand? It is all very simple. 1,000 canastitas cost me 100 times more work than a dozen. 10,000 cost me so much time and labor that I could never finish them, not even in 100 years. For 1,000 canastitas, I need more bass than for 100. And I need more little red beetles and more plants and roots for the dyes. Isn't that? It isn't that you can just walk into the bush and pick all the things you need at your heart's desire. One root with a true violet blue may cost me four or five days until I can find one in the jungle. And have you thought how much time it takes and how much hard work to prepare the bast and fibers? What is more, if I must make so many baskets, who will then look after my corn and my beans and my goats and chase for me occasionally a rabbit for meat on Sunday? If I have no corn, then I have no tortilla to eat. And if I grow no beans, where do I get my free... Frijoles? Frijoles from. But since you get so much money from me for your baskets, you can buy all the corn and beans in the world and more than you need. That's what you think, little lordy. But you see, it is only the corn I grow for myself that I'm sure of. Only the corn which others may or may not grow, I cannot be sure to feast upon. Haven't you got some relatives here in this village who might help you to make baskets for me? Mr. Winthrop asked, hopefully. Practically, the whole village is related to me somehow or other. Why then can't they cultivate your fields and look after your goats while you make baskets for me? Not only this, they might gather for you the fibers and the colors in the bush and lend you a hand here and there in preparing the material you need for the baskets. They might, Patroncito, yes, they might, possible, but then you see who would take care of their fields and cattle if they worked for me. And if they help me with a basket, it turns out the same. No one would any longer work in these fields properly. In such a case, corn and beans would get up so high in price that none of us could buy any, and we would all starve to death. Now you'll understand, highly estimated caballero and jefecito, why I cannot make the basket any cheaper than 15 pesos each if I've got to make that many. Under the title Loom Shuttles Warpaths, the artist Ines Duyok has for the past five years been researching textiles, starting out with the question how to enable older artifacts from the Amazonas region to appear in contemporary post-colonial contexts, to an investigation into the use of dyes and fabrics in the creation of 19th century financial markets, to an attempt to articulate the exploitation of textile workers all over the planet while avoiding re-victimization. In other words, Duyak's research and works are prolific. Lately, she has been taking on the fashion industry by venturing into the design of fabrics and consumer goods. And you, here you see a bag by hers. This is one example of this fashion series. Taking a Fendi bag from the, 19th from the 1970s as template, this handcrafted satchel was difficult to produce for their, and very, very expensive to produce for their very few craftspeople who have the skills to make such a high-end product. A museum in Switzerland thought that Art Basel would be a good opportunity to display this bag in the hope that it would be, could be sold and make the artist some money some desperately needed money. It certainly seemed to have all the qualities, this bag, of a fetish object that both art and designer handbags need in order to be marketable. But no buyer was found, and this gave me food for thought. All the stylistic aspects seem to be correct, and its production value can compete with Prada and the likes. It's really a, a really beautiful fetish object, this bag. 
Um, it's got even hand cast um, a relief, this little rabbit coming out of the alpha hat, it's, which is actually referring to Adam Smith's invisible hand. And this, um, the outside is silk, it's, a printed, it's printed by, um, um, it's designed by the artist, and it shows actually peop, um, carriers of, of um, um, carriers of, of some weight um, porters um, from Sao Paulo, from La Paz, and from Seoul. And because she was fascinated um, actually to see that even though so many of our contemporary production processes are highly computerized and mechanized, societies hasn't, the world hasn't gotten rid of the need for individual people to use their body to carry something, you know. So, um, so she, she got images from these um, actual people carrying things and she, she put them onto a fabric design and she had these printed, I think, in an Italian factory that also works for Prada. And then there's this um, rabbit fur in the back. Um, even just to make that, it was, she was really astonished how expensive that was. It was a bit of a problem, that's why they wanted to sell it. And they thought that a price of 15,000 euros would be a good price for it, especially in this context of Switzerland and, and, um, um, and Art Basel. So why did, did this not sell? And I was really thinking about that. I think there is an um, ambivalence here that is un, unnerving, um, which is that a ba you know, it suggests the usefulness because it has the shape of a bag, right? So, but it is, it is of no use because who would ruin, you know, who would buy such an object and re actually carry it? It doesn't make sense because even with the fur inside, it's impractical, yeah? So, um, so you, on the other hand, um, it's, not all, it's also not just a sculpture. It's not just an art object because it's a bag. So it kind of calls into question this, the idea of the aesthetic form, yeah? Because it's suggesting that it's, it's, a, it's an object to be used. So this doesn't add up and it's, it's, um, it's, it's ambivalent. So its status as a commodity doesn't make it possible to sell it commodify it as a work of art. I mean, of course, objects of art get commodified and then they're sold like a Prada bag. But here, the status of commodity actually counteracts that you can go through this aesthetic process to do this, yeah? Um, and then there's a similar transgression or transposition between this question of art and politics. Which also sits very uneasily in this object. And I think this is why it's a good work of art, because it sits so uneasily in this object. Um, and because if I'm bringing politics into this object, this fetish object, does it remain politics? But uh, on the other hand, I don't think so. But on the other hand, the object brings something into politics which doesn't exist normally in our ways of organizing politics and, 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 and signifying politics, you know, because it's bringing this aesthetical mehrwert surplus value into, you know, this idea of pleasure, of luxury that we don't associate at least with kind of revolutionary politics. But as um, Emma Goldman has said, if we can't dance, and um, we cannot make it, I don't want to be part of your revolution if I can't dance. And, 
this is an aspect of Ines' works that's always been really, really important to her, that she truly believes that, you know, we should not be without this pleasure. She's not only making this because she's trying to interact critically with the fashion industry, she's also making this because she loves fashion. And so she cannot afford it in the way that she would like to, so she's making her own art in order to have this pleasurable object. A last quote um, from the essay, a 2013 essay on string bags by Marilyn Strathern. We start with another as artifact that is associated with movement, in this case carrier bags worn over the body that travel with the body. They enable the body to be a carrier, a body plus what it carries, that is the relational extended person. So I, I haven't thought this through yet, but if I can call something from Duyak's bag for my future institution, then um, then it would actually be that I would try this institution to be similar to an artwork to carry this in its structural composition, this kind of ambivalence, so that um, politics doesn't get into it in a self-same discourse, but there's a, possibly a political effect of the way it's introduced in amb amb ambivalency, and the same happens to art. Thank you. Oh, maybe I need a translation. Um, mm. <coughs> by the way, um, the, um, the, the images I showed of other artworks were by uh, Maria Batusova from um, a Slovakian artist who died in the 80s, and this work is from the 70s and 80s. And um, the other was Mira Schendel, Brazilian artist, with these droginhas, these, these um, structures made from, they're, they're called literally little nothings, these structures made from paper, but that are looking, you know, that have netting and they can be handled, yeah. So. Um, um, I'll, say, I'll say something that I, you know, I'm trying to formulate, but um, as you were generous to throw something here which you're trying to digest, I'll, I'll try to do the same, but I don't know if I'm thinking through properly, but um, there's something that I don't know if you want to get into, and I don't know what that would mean in relation to the bilum or bilum, or, but it's something about the bag. I mean, the Ines can Ines can produce this bag without having to account or think about a certain type of effects or a chain of effects. Obviously, the money thing was one that she wanted and she needs, and and is completely respectable. But the 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 life, the afterlife of that bag, is something that she doesn't need to take into account fully. But in your in your school project, I think you, I mean, you could choose not to, but you may you may need to, or that question may be raised, what is it that this is to be done? No? I mean, because you, you, you'll be working with, at least, at least because, I mean, I don't want to be too ethical or too ethical heavy, because you will, I mean, you'll be working with these kids, and I mean, you know, why is this, a, a, you know, a, an interesting or, or good, or I mean, these are loaded words, or, or you know, um, what is it good? 
why is it good for them to spend the time doing this um, as yeah. opposed to something else? It's not, I mean, I don't want to be too heavy there, but mm. in some way this question is something that you would need to address in some way, even to say, no, I don't want to respond because, you know, you're, because I, it's not, I mean, some, you know, does, does it make sense? No, no, of course it makes sense. Um, uh, well, there was, uh, there was also someone who asked me, um, what about transparency? Is this bag transparent? And then you have this funny thing with the male and the female bags, one that is actually see-through because it's very functional, and the other one that's intransparent because it's about status. So we're starting to think this process about, you know, is an art institution like um, this adorned bag about status and what, what you need to get to is somehow this useful, this female bag. But I haven't thought this through yet, you know. I mean, there, this, there's a lot to be developed here. Um, but in principle, um, there are two answers to that. First of all, I'm not alone. And I can never establish an institution within a school without having figured out in discussion with others who are working there how to deal with these problems, yeah? Because it would never be allowed to do that, yeah? So in a way, I kind of have a safety net. But another answer is that I'm not, I don't want to be working with kids. I'm not, um, I want to put something there that is materially there that kids can see and that is somehow transparent to kids in certain ways so that they can decide whether they want to make a partial connection with it. Yeah? So it wouldn't be project-based with the kids. There could be situations where there are projects with kids, but also I know a lot of artists who are not interested in working with kids, and I would still think I would like to invite them to be there in a kind of a residency or so, a work there, so that it's... Um, that I would think that this question of how the children actually and the institution attaches, other than a way, physical way by actually placing it there and being there and being there the t as part of the everyday life of these kids, working on your things. Um, would be something that's process oriented and need to be, cannot be predetermined before the kids start to act, interact with that. Because it's actually, you know, you cannot just assume that kids are interested in art. Why should they be? You know, so that I would think that maybe something happens just because there is a kind of um, practice that becomes normalized for them that they see where other people are working and they can kind of spy on this process without being interjected, interpolated into it completely, um, you know, because then they, are, they need to take a position. And one of the problems is that kids really don't know, don't want to take a position before they are sure that this is not harmful to them, yeah? So, um, so I'm thinking of it more like, um, bringing it in and just it being there for a while and people working there and then s negotiating this slowly. And this school that I'm thinking of doing this in has some practice with this because they've worked, they've invited many people to come from the outside and do things there over a long time. So for instance, this project I showed you about the migration, yeah, that was a project there was two years, and it went through different iterations in which different kids could join it, in, and it was not, no one had to join in that, you know, could join and interact in a different ways. But it's true, in that way, the Enos bag doesn't help me with this problem, but the, I mean, this is the brilliant thing about the Stratern metaphor and, or allegory, it's really not more than that, I believe. It's not more than that. That you can actually think of, you know, how can I make this useful for me in this little aspect? How can I, to think something through and how can I take something else to make it useful to think, think something through and on another aspect?
Thank you. Um, do you think that, um, as you described, the lack of uh, aesthetic pleasure in the political uh, 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 realm, uh, is that something that has to do with the German political system, or do you think it is general? I once heard a talk by a um, New York, I think from the New School of Research, so, uh, New School, and, and uh, um, an academic who was trying to argue that um, this kind of, not just pleasure, but also actually ressentiment, this kind of like aggression or bad feelings, are not used by the left well enough. And that one of the successes, reasons why the Tea Party was so successful and popular war was because it managed to somehow um, um, enter into this affectivity, yeah? So, um, so I think it's not just a, a German problem, but I don't think that um, pleasure should be had without ambivalence or conflict. Just another metaphor so that maybe you can add to, to that uh, uh, use that you're doing of a string back and uh, education. There is actually one uh, thing that uh, Mackenzie or the Straden via Mackenzie tells about the process of learning of making the string backs, the bylooms. Apparently it's this tale that mothers tell the daughters when they teach them because it's a, it's a craft that is taught from mother to, to daughter. Apparently, there's a tale that they tell that is, uh, you, we will, you will make your first bylum. It will be a very clumsy bylum because your hands are very clumsy. Then we'll put it on the river. The river will take away that clumsy first clumsy bylum, and with it, it will take the clumsiness of your hands. And then from then on, you will be able to make proper bylums. So this idea that uh, uh, you get rid of um, the object itself is the process and that there's this, uh, this idea of the river, no? uh, washing away the clumsiness. I don't know if that, as a metaphor, has mm -hmm. anything to do with, um, um, with education as a, as a project as well. I, th I mean, I think this, uh, this uh, um, approach is a problem within education that is probably not solvable by one institution in one instance, which is that it, there's no um, leeway, no room for failure. It's not, and we talked about this earlier yesterday, um, it's not considered educational if something, we're still thinking that education is about transmission of knowledge or trans transmitting the skills to acquire knowledge. Um, and I think at this point, if you, you were to introduce something that is you know, where people engage and put energy into, and it's hard because it's also hard for teachers because they have to somehow figure out how to adapt their very strict, at least within the German regular school, we're not talking about private school, we're talking about a, a school system in Germany which is highly directive by the state and has a long tradition of being directed by the state um, in its structural aspect. So, for them to even find the energy to do something that is somehow subverting this or going against this or somehow making some excess is already a huge effort. So um, then to see this go to, to send this away in the river, that would be really hard lessons. So I think this motif is maybe something that possibly I can use for myself you know, maybe I have to send a few of these bags into the river before I can, you know, really be successful at, at making this. Um, but um, I wouldn't want to, you know, I, this is where I would like to take this as my responsibility at this point in time, because I don't think that the schools that are existing are able to to deal with this at this point. Ideally, I think it would be really great if we could teach that failure is part of a process of growing and that it's also part of life. 
And I mean, that's what Kasha Silverman, to come back to this failure to identify, you know, the failure to assimilate the other as a self same is something that we actually experience. But even within identity, it's not, it's thought as something that we must repress, or, you know, if, it, if we cannot repress it, we, we react very vi violently to, to it. And she says, actually, that art can teach you to deal with that. Her idea is that um, there is a kind of idealization that, that happens in, in the art objects. She uses like very traditional um, concepts like Benjamin's aura and so on for that, that can allow you to carry, be carried away from your self-sameness, from yourself, from this coherent self, because you ideal with something that's you know, very distant and different from you. And this, within looking, receiving art and looking at art and dealing with art, that is actually something that can teach you to deal with these psychic processes also in social situations or in other situations. But I think that is um, very, very far away from most educational models we have in the West. Even from museums, you know. ¿Alguien más quiere hacer alguna pregunta, algún comentario? Pues, eh, pues, thank you very much, Ruth. And, uh, and, como estamos de tiempo, nos damos un descanso de cinco minutos. Nos damos un descansito de cinco minutos mientras preparamos la siguiente intervención. Muchas gracias.